it, it all starts with a st- you, you, the longest journey starts with a first step. And if you do that a little bit at a time, you're going to see great things happen. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Welcome to the Talk About the Magic podcast, where you'll find inspiration and encouragement tied together with the magic of Disney. Now, here's your host, Joseph Ballesteros. What is going on, Magic Tears? Welcome to another edition of Talk About the Magic. I'm so excited you're joining me today. Thank you so much for taking the time out to download this episode and hear it. I have a wonderful guest, uh, Fred, who has been, <laughs> I made a joke, in the show, he has lived three different lives in his one life. It's pretty It's pretty amazing. He's, he was in the military, he became a teacher, and now he's on his own uh, inv- uh, venture of creating this website called GetMeCoding.com, where he's helping uh, people who are not necessarily, who maybe who feel overwhelmed, I should say, when it comes to coding. He's helping them understand that it's not as complicated as it may seem. So I'm excited to have him here on the show today. Of course, we still have that mutual love for Disney and apparently a little bit, probably uh, too much uh, love for Lou Mangella as well. <laughs> but uh, I really got, I really hope you guys will get some inspiration and get some uh, you know encouragement from this show. If it's your first time here, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. This is what Talk About the Magic show is all about here on the podcast. It's about getting uh, people who are pursuing their dreams and passions and using their story to inspire you. So hopefully, if it's your first time here, you'll, you'll stick around. And of course, if you are a you know regular listener, please be sure to spread the word out. That, that's, how, that's how you can help out the show so much. And of course, if you're not already aware, please be sure to check out TalkAboutTheMagic.com. Every day, uh, I'm posting up one to two articles regarding Disney news, you know, rumors, all the fun stuff. Uh, that site is kind of a little love, um, you know, site that I have now. It started off just sharing this podcast once a week, but now I actually made it to like a full-fledged uh, new style site. I love being able to share that stuff with you guys. So please be sure to check out TalkAboutTheMagic.com and that way you can check out and find out all the latest things that are happening uh, when it comes to Disney. And without further ado, let's get into our interview with Fred. Hello, Fred. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really honored for you to allow me to come in and kind of share some of my experiences and, and talk to you about uh, some great topics. I'm, I'm excited to have you on. Uh, I, I, you know, when I was reading your backstory and I, and I was, you know, checking out the site and everything that you're doing, I was really impressed and at the same time, like, completely kind of shocked in a way because you're doing so much and you've done so much that it was kind of, it was, to me, it was very interesting to see, you know, like, wow, okay, you know, what is making him do this? What is motivating him to say, this is not enough? You know, what I've done is not enough. I want to keep going and doing more. So, you know, we're going to get into the story and, and everything that you're doing. But before we get, uh, you know, into that area, let's go ahead and let the Magic Cheers know a little more about who Fred is. Well, it, it's it's a story that I get to share um, a lot of times when I'm speaking um, in in my other professional life, and and it's it's basically a story of I was a kid growing up in Pennsylvania. Um, sad sad part is my dad died at a at a at a very young age. He was only 42. I'm 49 now, and so on. But um, I was an only child. And it was just me and my mom, but my mom is actually one of 12. So oh, wow. I was raised, I was raised by, yeah, I was raised by actually a, a deluxe version of the, of the Brady Bunch. There were six boys and six girls. And I'm sure you can understand that then translates into cousins, <laughs> but, um, really my, my life did change at that, in that summer. And I know that, um, you know, I, I know other people have uh, much more sad stories and so on, but this really wasn't as sad as it may sound. I mean, what it did was in 1977, I'm a 77 Star Wars kid, and uh, I went to see that first Star Wars movie, and honest, honest to goodness, it was one of those moments that it, it just changed me. But on top of that, I'm an Atari kid, so video games, mm-hmm. Star Wars, that just started to create that spark that that uh, that drove me to be interested in science fiction and technology. But really, where my where my passion was... Uh, starting to become a little bit more, I guess, evident was I, w- I wanted to be an astronaut, you know, and and so I figured I had to start to put together how how do you get to that point? Like what what's the path to follow? So I was, and, you know, once again, this is the 1980s, um, you know, Top Gun and 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 the Reagan era of of you know seeing the military change, and all of a sudden I found myself uh, going to Penn State University studying computer science, and then. 
I got involved in the Marine Corps officer program. I, I don't think I'm the stereotypical Marine. Of course, I'm only five, seven, but the, uh, the thing is it, 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 it was my pathway to get into the cockpit of an aircraft, which at that time, everybody going into the astronaut Corps was primarily former military, former test pilot still. So the, or, this is still early shuttle space shuttle program. They weren't really looking for scientists as much as they are today. And, uh, that was the path that it went down. And so technology has been woven in and out of my life. But I, I really have to thank my mom in, in, in one regards. And that's that she had worked for as a data entry supervisor for a small company in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And where that's where she understood how, the role of technology. I guess she saw it coming and she knew computers were going to be, quote unquote, big. And uh I started to fool around with a Timex Sinclair 1000, then a Commodore 64, then an IBM PS Model 25. Uh, P- well, yeah, and that was and that was pretty much it. And I uh, hung out with a, with a bunch of guys. We played Dungeons and Dragons. And one day, when well, my one buddy in ninth grade said, um, "Why don't we make a game?" And now you're, st- you're you got to understand, we're still this is this is not this is 8-bit graphics days. This is nothing like what's out there today. So our version of a game then was we had to come up with a script and we scripted a Dungeons and Dragons type game and we coded it in basic and uh, it was horrible, but it was, uh, (laughs) but it was, it, it was, you know what it was? It was us hanging out on Friday nights and Saturday nights kind of, I, we were at my, on, on my dresser in my bedroom in front of a black and white, you know, television connected to a computer. And, we taught ourselves how to program. And, and from that, I, you know, I went on to college and I kind of furthered it. So now today, here I am. Um, I became, well, I was a Marine for a number of years and I traveled the world. I left as a major, uh, in the early two thousands after nine 11. And I met my wife. I became a software developer. I was working as you might want to say as a, a consultant for the Oracle technology. Mm-hmm. And it was back in my home area and we grew our family. I, um, I adopted my oldest. And when we had two other additional children, and now I have uh, my family, my oldest is in grad school and, uh, and my two younger ones are in high school now. And I still teach. I've been there 18 years, which I cannot <laughs> believe because I, I, I just, I just was hanging. I just stopped by there just to catch my breath. But that was really serendipitous because my project in software development was shrinking. And all of a sudden I thought I'd stop by to see my old computer science professor and he said, hey, Fred, how would you like to teach a uh, college course? And I said, okay. And I said, well, what do you have in mind? He goes, we need someone to teach an advanced PowerPoint class. And I'm like, advanced PowerPoint? You know, what, what, is, what is that? So all of a sudden, um, I went back. I taught a night course, and I, and I really loved it. I mean, I, I, I love being in the classroom. I love being able to give people something, a little bit of myself, and seeing them take it and run it and run with it. And uh, so... Uh, it went well. Then I learned my project team was shrinking even more, and I realized, wow, I'm, I'm I got married, I have a daughter, I'm instant dad. I, I what am I going to do, you know? And so they were telling, they told me that a new degree was starting up, and they needed to staff it up. And I, I threw my hat in the ring, and I got the job. And and one of those things was, and that was 18 years ago. Now I'm program co coordinator. But now I'm also doing other things, and I'm venturing off, and I'm and I'm highly involved now with our entrepreneurship at our campus, mm-hmm. and that's where you're seeing all these efforts now. Um, you know, I, I really believe that if you can't find the job, make the job, and 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 now I'm learning, and I'm learning from people who I consider are just amazing people. Um, I'm seeing stuff that you're doing. I'm, I'm seeing stuff like we were talking, uh, Lou Mangiello, uh, and and Lauren Gaggioli, and Jennifer Hoffman, and just people that are yeah, it's just, it's just good. So that's where I am now. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm venturing off into new spaces, um, and trying new things. And, and it's funny, I, uh, I won't say how old I am, but I'm a little <laughs> bit older than you. And, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm finding myself making new friends, um, yeah. and ultimately carving out a new direction to go in. And, and it's, and it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. And, and so, you know, I wanted to kind of get into this part because even though you've, you've been interested at least in some kind of programming since you were, you were young, you know, going that you went into the military, what was that transition like as far as when you got out to say, okay, I, I want to do something? You know, a lot of people, maybe even some of the listeners either have been in the military or in there now, 
and they're a little nervous because maybe they're not, you know, maybe they know they're going to be coming out soon or something like that. And you always hear these stories, you know what I mean? You always hear, you know, issues that come up where, you know, a lot of people from the military either can't find jobs or, you know, they feel like they're not being, you know, they, 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 if it's a different world, in other words, because you're coming from, you know, such a high, you know, tensed, you know, really focused in style of a job to mm -hmm. the world now where thank god you know because of people like you and thank you for your service that we don't even necessarily sometimes understand how serious things are in other places of the world because right. we're you know we're here in our you know air conditioned room or in our air conditioned office doing you know work and we're grumbling and angry about it because we're like this is ridiculous yet we don't understand how many people are out there actually giving their lives and fighting for us to have that privilege so how did you how did that mindset kind of change to say okay i'm coming out from this this is this is what i've known this has been my security um and and, and it's a good security I, i'd assume but uh to say i'm gonna now take this leap and, and go into something else yeah well that's that's a great question that is a really great question <laughs> um so Yeah, I could have stayed 20 years. And, you know, 9-11 came. I was at that point now off of active duty and in the reserves. And I'm not going to bore you with, you know, the differences that. But the bottom line was I, I spent a number of years on active duty. And then I, I, I slid over and moved over into the reserves. And I, I did that primarily. I stayed in the reserves because I, I just missed the camaraderie. There's a, there is a bond that gets created. The military for me, first of all, was like the best thing in the world because it created options. And, and that's another thing. That's why I think going to school in some capacity, whether it's higher education, a trade school, whatever, it's all about creating options. You don't want to have to get funneled into one singular path. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that's where, when I was in there and I, and I started to see where I went back to school, I got my advanced degree while I was on active duty. It was really tough to study and, and work. Um, I, I know a lot of people I'm sure that are listening to this know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, going to graduate school while you're working a full-time job, if you're taking care of parents or kids or whatever, it's, it's a, it's a heavy, it's a heavy load, but you know, you keep your eye on the prize and you hope that you're going to, you're, when you get there, it's going to open up even more options or more doors. When I, when I made the decision, it was the hardest decision. I think it's one of the hardest decisions I think I've ever made because I was actually leaving something that had been so good to me. Yeah. There's, there's crappy times with everything. And I always hear the one thing, oh, I can never go in the military because they tell you what to do. Well, <laughs> they tell you what to do wherever you go, you know? True. So it's, it's, it's a funny thing when I hear that, but the, but really when I, when I made that decision, um, I was scared first I, I'll, real quick. I'll tell you this one funny thing. I have a lot of friends who were pharmaceutical reps, you know, they would work for these pharmaceutical companies and they would go into sales and so on. And, and, you know, they're buying suits and ties and matching shoes and, and all that good stuff. Well, when you spend 12 years in the, the military, you're pretty much wearing the same thing every day. And when it came to dressing, I'm not a, I'm not a fashion mogul by any <laughs> stretch of me, magic, but it was one of those things that, um, I realized that 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 alone made me nervous. How am I going to dress? What do you buy? You know, so you end up going through placement agencies, and they specialize in taking junior military officers and, and translating them into, you know, corporate ease type people. But the mindset, I, I will share this. My first job that I took, um, I won't I won't say the company, but it was in the Northeast, and it was a major telecommunications company. And when I took the position there. Uh, I was working alongside a lot of other former junior military officers and senior enlisted uh, uh, types that came out of the military. And, and it was awesome. We were like all in the same office space. We all had the same, you know, we all were all still using the same acronyms. We also had short hair. So we all, it was kind of weird. It was like a neat transition. But they also teamed us up with some very senior people. And I'll never forget the one day when I really couldn't be attending uh, to my voicemail to field calls from these other engineers because I was working in an engineering type hub. Mm -hmm. And um, all of a sudden, I went over to my mentor who, who was, you know, with the company forever. And I said, hey, you know, so-and-so, I, I left on my voicemail because I'm going to be at training next week. I'm not going to be able to help them out directly and support them. I said, they can reach out to you. And he looked at me and he said, no, you go back to your voicemail and you tell them that you will get back to them when you can. I am not taking your calls. And that was the first time I realized I am out of the military because in the military, that at least for me, that was second nature. You just did it. And, and all of a sudden I'm like, wow, what, what did I do? You know, <laughs> but, but then at the same time, the one thing, and I'm sure if, if you, if you know anybody in the military, the one thing that I noticed we have this ability to 
look at things going on around us and, and say, you know, nobody's dying here. So let's keep our heads and move move forward. You know, I mean, that is if you're in a position where there's literally nobody dying. I mean, if you're in if you're in law enforcement or something else, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, there's risk. But that shift in mindset for me was one of wow. But then it was a realization of hey, I have something that I'm looking at some other people may not have, and that's this ability to be self-starting and take initiative and 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 think of things in an organized way. So yeah, it was a little bit of a shift at first, and then once I got my feet underneath me. It, it it felt pretty good. It did feel pretty good, but I did miss. There was a there was an element of camaraderie that I did miss too. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, I I like what you say and what you said there. And what's funny is, as weird as it is, again, I don't think a lot of us have that mindset. I personally kind of came up to that mindset, you know, just maybe two or three years ago, where I had to start kind of training my mind to stop freaking out the way it would of mm. things that was happening because I realized like. This is this is not the end. Like this is okay. You're gonna get you know to go to forget this when work is over. You're gonna get to you know do this and play with your kids. You're not like you said. You're not doing so. It, like for me, my experience. Uh, you know, I was working for a company, um, and uh, we were doing cold calls, and we would basically mm-hmm. cold call you know people offering a certain style of shirts. Pretty much the typical. You know, this is back when telemarketing was was big, but at the same time, everybody hated telemarketers. I think. I don't know. They, I think they still do. But <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I, I was taking the job there, and I was, you know, doing my calls, and you know, I remember just thinking like, this isn't fun because I kept getting, you know, cursed at. I kept getting yelled at. I kept getting, and then at the same time, there would be like that one person who was just being nice about it, and whenever we would send an agent to them, they would end up yelling at me. You know, the agent would yell at me because he says like I was lying, and I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, they said you can go. And it kind of came to a point because the, the the boss at the time, he would walk around all of us while we were on the phones, just pacing. And mm. when when we would kind of like stop, whether it was to take a break, drink some water, whatever, he would come to us. And I'll never forget this. He was a big guy and he had a big gold ring on his finger. And he would come to next to us and he would tap his his he would tap his fingers on the desk like Oh boy! And he would say, "Dialing for dollars. You're dialing for dollars," <laughs> and yeah. that has stuck in my head from then on because I quit after that. I said, "No, I'm not," and I, because I couldn't believe that there was some that you know that mentality of like this is it or nothing, and I I just was so angry. I was so upset because I was like, "Why don't you call? Like if mm. you think you are so good at this, I know you're a boss. I know you." But then you get on this phone and you prove to me that you're able to knock out, you know, 50 calls and all of them being right and all of them saying yes. So that kind of shifted my mindset, too, to change to say, you know what? For some reason, we immediately think that what we're doing is the most important thing in the world. And when it goes wrong, we panic and yeah. we, we feel like stress. We feel like it's the end of it all. And we have to really understand, like you said, unless it's a, it's a ser- you know serious situation where you are like dealing with something like that. For the most part, it, it really isn't the end of the world. It, it's it's no. it's more about take a, you know take some time out, breathe in real deep, figure out what's going on, and, and try to you know get better at it so it doesn't keep messing up there. But man, that's yeah, that's 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 great that you're able to kind of come across the mindset to say okay, let's you know kind of reshape our our whole idea here of what we need to be freaking out about and and then also not really freaking out about so <laughs> right right because you really don't make any good decisions when you're under that kind of stress i Very mean true. there's there's sure there's battlefield stress where it's life-threatening um but i think in the corporate world yeah it's stressful there's no doubt about it people are under the gun yeah. but sometimes you know you got to take a step back and, and and really be able to say hey all right let's let's look at everything here so you can be clear-headed and you can make the right decision for sure so you know, you you've you've done all this, and like I said, you were in the military, and and you've now transitioned when you were becoming a teacher. So, what made you now take on a new thing of GetMeCoding dot com? This is a site that really helps, um, kind of actually getting people to simple. It's simplifying coding, I should say, I guess, where it's it's helping people like me learn about coding. So, I guess if you could give a, a layman's term <laughs> a definition of exactly what coding is. And then, of course, why you said, I'm going to start this and, and, and you know, pursue this new journey of mine. 
Yeah, sure. No, first and first and foremost, coding coding is a is a buzzword. It, it basically means software programming, which is more of the traditional uh, definition of the traditional way of looking at how do you write software, right? So, for those of us who have been around a little while since the '80s and the '90s, in a formal sense, it's software development. Now, all of a sudden, um, we're realizing that there's a a need. A growing need, and it and it's driven by a number of things. But there's a growing need for us to create more professionals that can write software programming. However, um, it evolved into the aspect of calling it coding. Now, for me, um, you know, I've been involved in higher education for a while, and I see things from from two perspectives. I see it from a data perspective, and I see it from a firsthand perspective. And we are missing the boat, and meaning we're not we're not creating enough of these professionals to, cause to take advantage of these opportunities that are, that are existing. So back around 1999, um, we were, we were hearing stories about that there was going to be 300,000 jobs in information technologies. There's going to be a shortage and all, you know, in higher education was going to respond. And the response was based on how many people we can have come through what I would call a pipeline, you know, from secondary education into colleges and into the workforce. Well, it just seemed like the pipeline was very, very meek. It was very meager. It was, it was very light. There wasn't, we weren't putting through the people that we thought. Um, a, a number of years ago in the 1990s, we were watching also a steady decline in the number of computer science graduates in the United States. So you have to start to ask yourself, like, what's going on here? Now, I'm sure that there's people listening out here who know about Common Core and, and traditional um, learning and education processes and so on. I'm not going to blame anything along those lines because we are at the point we are at and we need to do something about it. And and the thing that um, I, I would travel to schools and talk at talk with young people and talk with parents and you and you find out there that people and people might not have always liked math um but now they really don't like math and 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 ma- and math is interesting like i was never a super stellar student i just knew that i wanted to i need to, well i was being told that i needed to learn this stuff in, in order to get to where i wanted to be for example if i wanted to be an astronaut i knew i wanted to go down an engineering path and if i wanted to get to engineering i needed to be better at at math so i i you know i in junior and senior high school i i, I said okay i got to focus on this and i i can remember being in the kitchen with my mom and getting her all frustrated because she was only high school educated. She knew nothing about calculus. I'm taking senior high school calculus and not knowing what, what to do. There was no internet. Uh, my other friends on the block weren't taking the class at that time. So it was, it was very stressful. A lot of tears uh, in those days, you know. So um, now here I am. I'm in a position and I'm, I, I, I don't blame teachers I think the system is the, what the system is. I think they see it. But I, I started to realize, you know, I could do more. I, I could actually start to package something that we can expose to young people. And even if you're a little bit older or older, it really, there's really no age barrier. But I, I do also want to help moms and dads and who are doing anything with, um, you know, keeping their kids at home and homeschooling and cyber schooling and so on. Like they could take this stuff and begin to expose kids to that. And if we can get started earlier, I think that will help us get people a little bit more interested so that when they get to that junction and they can make a choice of whether or not they want to go down a technology path or or the non-technology path, at least we might have more people now in the pool who will make that choice. Because really innovation is going to come from people who could think and, and not just so much people who can just do the tech. Now, there, there are definitely, there is definitely a need for people who are going to be hardcore engineers doing serious technology uh, research and, and development. But we also need people who aren't going to be afraid of it. And, and, I, and I think if we create more of those people, we're going to expose them to more options, whether they're going traditional business route or they're going to a science route or a liberal arts route. At least now they're, they're familiar with this area and they can move forward and, and not move away from it. And that's really what got me going as I was just hoping to spark some more interest and ultimately start to lift back the veil that you can get started with this. And, and yes, it can get rigorous, but also there's technologies that are out there now, Joe, that you, you really don't need a formal computer science background to be developing apps. I mean, granted, it does help, but you can. It's it's accessible. It's more accessible to us than it's ever been, and yet it seems like we have fewer people interested in it than ever before. And once again, I, I've seen the data. It is starting to turn. Um, I just hope we don't lose a generation in the process 
and and that that could be harmful for the United States. So that's that's really what got me going on. I said, you know what, um, I'm going to put this out there and and take what I know and begin to offer it in a different way. And if it if it sticks, awesome. If I could help at least one family, then then you know what I've I've served my just I say the same thing in my classroom. If I can help one student learn this, I've done my job, and that's where really where this is all going. That's amazing. That's that's awesome. I mean, to to have a passion like that, I think is 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 amazing in itself. Just because I've I've messed with. Well, I I don't think I've messed with software. I can't say that. Just because I do websites and stuff doesn't mean I've messed with it to the extent, to the no. extent you're probably you're teaching. But you know, you're you're right, hundred percent. That's kind of the big concern as parents that we have, you know, with our own kids. Because it's funny, I tell my wife, I'm like, do you understand that, you know, our kids are growing up in a world that we truly, 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 truly do not understand. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what's funny yes. is, you know, when we were growing up as kids, our parents would tell us, you know, like this and this and this. And and for the most part, it was on it was pretty much on par. But in the past, literally 10 years, 10 to 15 years, we've gotten an insane boost in technology yes. from, you know, the phones, computers. To, and so I like, I, you know, I tell my wife because, you know, we go on, you know, all parents go through this phase of she would let our kids play with the tablet. She would let them use the phone. She would let them mm-hmm. do this. She would let them do that. And, it, you know, it becomes to a point where, like, for you know, for her, I told her, I said, you know, we have to understand that whether we like it or not, this stuff is here. So what we need to do is just teach them how to use it that is going to help them and better them. We don't want it to – we don't want them to use it as a as a crutch to cheat, you know. You know, it, it reminds me, like, for us, the big deal was when we were in school, when we were going to take a math test, like, you better not have a calculator or <laughs> – right. Right. Or a calculator watch. We do not allow calculator <laughs> watches either here. Like that was a big deal. And here it is. It's like you got a cell phone, you got watches, you got little smart apps, you got iPhones. Like so many things where teachers can't really control anymore how they're going to, you know, unless they literally say drop the phone in the bucket when you get in class, um, how they're going to, you know, dictate on the way the kid will learn. So for, you know, I told her like we have to embrace technology, but at the same time teach them the core values of the only way this technology exists is because people did it without it. You know, and people did all this, this stuff that they've done without this kind of technology. You know, it, it blows my mind to to think that, you know, we visited the moon without the power of a MacBook Pro. You know what I mean? Right, without right, with, without right. any aid of an iPad. You know, Disney created the Magic Kingdom without using any kind of cheat mm-hmm. software on, you know, on Samsung Note 8. So we, we have to appreciate what's come, you know, before us. But at the same time, it's exciting because everybody before us kept looking into the future. And so we have to kind of look back into the past to respect them as well and say, okay, we're going to take this future seriously. We're not going to take advantage of it and just kind of... So I love what you're doing because that, that's such that's such a true thing that we need to learn. And you're right. A lot of us do feel, you know, especially the older generation, do feel like a little overwhelmed. It's like, oh, it's too difficult. We'll never figure it out. But it's like, no, I mean, that's... it. Ha- just like everything else, it has a core structure, a core base that you can actually learn. And once you grasp that, as complicated as the problem is, you always go back to that core and that'll help you solve it. So yes. That, yeah. And, awesome. and you know, one of the, one of the analogies I, I, I often convey to students when they're trying to understand like, what's, do you go down computer science or do you go down the information sciences or information technology degree path or, or something similar? Um, and like what you're saying is, is, is kind of like what I is echoing what I, what I tell them. If you, if I'm not a, I'm not a expert on NASCAR by any means, but if you think about NASCAR and you think about the vehicle, right. Um, you know that the vehicle is maintained by, a core team of experts. They build the transmission, they build the motor, they build the, the the frame and everything like that. But they're not the ones driving it, right? So now all of a sudden you get some other person coming in who's an expert in handling the vehicle and using it in a way to win races. So what you're what you're going to see is you're always going to see a need for people to be the code the tool builders, but you're also going to see another group of people who are also going to be uh, using these tools to solve problems that they have in their in their business life. Now they've been telling us that's coming for years and years and years, but it's it's really starting to arrive now. And you and you made a great point. Since about 2007, a lot of things came together in 2007, and there's a couple books that talk about it. But in 2007, we saw the iPhone, which and then we saw social media. 
And then really we saw big data, but more importantly, we saw the, the exponential increase in speed of processing chips, which allows us now to move through data and analyze things faster than ever before, which is allowing us to create things quicker. Um, so now all of a sudden, um, Scratch and 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 Game Fruit and some of the tools that I put on my website with GetMeCoding.com and that people could look at these tutorials and we're going to be putting more out there. They utilize block coding and and they look like Lego blocks. They represent the coding constructs. So we're back in the day. Uh, you used to need to write the line of code. Now you're snapping blocks together. Now I'm sure that there's technology and there's software programmers who might be listening to this and they'll say, no, you still need to know how to write a cron, uh, cron tab script. You need to write uh, you know, a module or a library. You're, yes, you're right, you do. But now there's a whole layer on top of it that's allowing us, as long as you could think and you understand the business process that you're trying to work within and the problem you're trying to solve, you don't need to know how to write a for loop. You don't need to know how to do these other things that the computer science people will be doing. So that's kind of empowering in a way. And we actually went through a very similar phase like that when we when we saw desktop computing arrive. Remember, like you might not remember, but prior to des the desktop computer, all computing, all computing and all requests were made to the IT group in the basement with the mainframe. And you had to submit everything to them, and then they turned around and they gave it back to you. Then when the desktop computer came out, now all of a sudden we empowered a whole new group. Well, that empowerment is happening again. The problem that I see that we have to overcome, though, is we can't be afraid of that. And you, you raise a really good point. I, I could tell you this. I, I gave a final exam this past year. It was totally open resources, meaning I'm going to throw a problem or a series of problems at you that are going to be unique. You're not going to be able to Google it, but you're going to need to know where to go to get it and utilize the Internet to help you solve it. I was really shocked to see how many of my students struggled with that. They, they, they were still in that older mode of, of thinking. And I started to realize that, you know, I mean, yeah, when you have access to the internet on your cell phone, and everyone will always say, oh, if the cell phone dies, you're not going to be able to do anything. Well, <laughs> that's true. But you know what? There's, there's a great talk, and I, know I'm gonna, and I can't quite remember the name of it, but somebody brought it to my attention once, and, and I don't remember the exact year, but somewhere in the mid-1800s, uh, there was a teacher that once said, we have to continue to teach these kids how to make ink because if they don't have ink making skills, they're not going to know how to write in the future. Mm. And, you know what I mean? And so yeah. all of a sudden, here we are now in, 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 you know, 2017 and we have, we still have educators who are out there saying we can't let them go in the classroom with a smartphone because what are they going to do if they don't have that smartphone with them? And, you know, I mean, so we, we invented the ballpoint pen. We invented, you know, other writing utensils and ways to record notes and so on. So it, it's often, a, a, you know, like how do we get over that hump? Like, how do we get over that fear that, we're, oh, my gosh, we're going to teach them something that... So you're right. I, I, st I do struggle with it in the classroom. Like, how much do they know? You know, how much would be inherent knowledge? And some of it can be looked up, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think ultimately we have to continue to help people understand that it's not as difficult as, as, as it appears, but there is a level of rigor out there if you want to go down that path. And, and to your also tell the other comment you made too about the website, that is part of coding. There's a lot of people that don't understand that when you look at a website, if, even if it's WordPress, you're just looking at a text file. And, and when, you, when, you, when, you also, when you ultimately show that to somebody, they're like, wow, that's what it is? Yeah, that's it. You know, and then you add a whole bunch of other things between graphics and everything else, but yeah. it starts off with a simple text file. Well, it's funny. Is the reason why I say it is because, of course, in school, that's this was a big thing, learning HTML and all that. Mm -hmm. And oh, it was so terrible. I was so proud of myself <laughs> because we, had, I, I was able to figure out with HTML. Of course, I could not remember now how to do it. How to figure out how to put a website up that literally just said hi. Like it took <laughs> me that much. To, so nowadays, you're right with WordPress and everything. When I'm doing WordPress, it's it's like oh, because it because yes, I understand HTML file, but at the same time, I don't write it. Somebody else did it. I copy pasted. I'm good. So <laughs> so yes, yeah, yes. it's it's. But how much then? How has your mindset changed from? Because again, you've done quite a bit of of. <laughs> It's 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 interesting because I'm thinking about you now and I'm like it's weird because you literally have lived probably about three different styles of life that a lot of people <laughs> will live for the rest of their life and you've oh. already done three uh, being in the military being a teacher and now being you know an entrepreneur by focusing on helping with the website and everything doing this so you know how much has your mindset mindset changed from when you let's let's say even when you barely were getting into the military all the way till now wow. Um... 
That's that's a great observation, and 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 and, 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 and there's a compliment in there that's incredibly flattering, and and I and I, I appreciate hearing that. I've never looked at it that way, because um, you know you go through life, and when you have kids, and you have parents, and you know you have all these issues going on, it, you just kind of move with the the current. And but yeah, there are there are some things I, for me. The one thing that is, I've become more entrepreneurial minded, and you know, being an entrepreneur yourself, you start to realize that you just got to press. And, and really anything you put your mind to, um, you, you could, you can, you can achieve. I think at one point in time, I really felt like I wasn't good enough. Like when I was going in the military, I was all, I was the small guy. So I couldn't be as big as that, as strong as that guy doing that, but it didn't matter. I, I got through it and I still graduated high in my class. I mean, it was, but I wasn't learning from that. It's, it's taken me a long time to learn that. We all have gifts and we, we have to realize that we continue to move forward and we can learn from our mistakes and they're not really setbacks, they're set ups. They're basically getting you ready for the next big thing. And, and I don't think I realized that early enough on. And I've been touching on entrepreneurship here and there for many years. And I'll be honest with you, and, and Lou Mangiello and I just recently talked about this. And I, I still give credit to a, a fellow like him, and, and I believe like you, where you take that full step forward. Boom, you're in it. And there's risk. There's still a lot of us, I think, that are risk averse. We want that comfort. You know, we want to make sure that we could still always go back if we have to, you know, and so on. But I think I'm learning now that um, have confidence in yourself you know, you, you're going to be all right. And ultimately, you know, there's, there, there, did I lose you? No, no, no. Oops. Oh, no, no. Um, the, you, you, you realize that, um, you know, you can make it, you're going to be fine and you're going to learn from this and move on again. It's always be, you're always being prepared for that next level. A lot of people are just like, Hey, I arrived and, and that's it. Um, and they and they get caught off guard by the next challenge. So I think that's the biggest change in my mindset is that I'm now I'm always being prepared for the next thing. And that's why here I am as I get older, I guess there will always be a next thing. And for me <laughs> for me I always want to be able to get back to Disney World. Um but the thing <laughs> is but the thing that's that's the whole game and I, I try to instill that in my kids. You know, you don't you don't just arrive. Yeah. It's it's a journey. Yeah, for sure. It, and it's interesting cuz like again everything you said there uh, I don't know what I don't know how I'm going to ask you at the end to give some advice because that was fantastic already. So, but no. uh, I, I I agree with you 100. percent And and it's funny because yeah, again, it goes back to what we tell our kids. It again, it's a whole different world. Growing up, you know, it was instilled to go to school and not in the way that you said in the sense of so you have options and stuff like that. It was more because if you don't, you will fail. Like if you don't, you will be on the streets. You know, no questions asked. And I was very you concerning because for somebody like me who struggled in school as much as I did and then went to college and struggled even more and never really understood what could I do like I didn't have any kind of my my passion was music and at the mm. time all of the stuff that we have now wasn't available and when I went to college and I told him I want to I want to be music I want to do recording I want to be able to you know do recording and and you know be a musician maybe even a studio musician the counselor told me okay here you go here's what you can do and it was a music teacher. And I was like, okay, that's not what I just said. Like, I was no, no, nothing at all of what I had wanted. And it's funny because now the world is so different that, yeah, like you said, it really is a journey. And we gotta t we're teaching our kids there's so many possibilities out there that you don't – you only hurt yourself by saying that you can't do it. You got to try because there's yes. so much out there that, that is there to help. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, to take you to that next level, level. and not to say you're always going to succeed, but you, you have to at least try. So um, I really, the mindset change that you had is, is incredible because it's something I think, like I said, a lot of us don't have. We, we get concerned, we get wrapped up, we feel like it's the end if this just doesn't take off the way it should right away. Um, and, and I think that's amazing. And speaking, speaking of Lou, you know, I reached out to you because we're in, in, our, in our Facebook group together. Um, and I had asked you, okay, well, how did you get connected with Lou? I, I did the hub, you know, where we were doing the mastermind with him. And you actually did something that he's he just started doing last year. Um, and he's doing this year again. But I have it's I was interested in it, so I'm really excited to hear about it, which was the mastermind um, that, uh, that – the momentum, I should say, mastermind kind of – it's a whole different mm -hmm. kind of way that went about it. So 
Can you give a little bit, how was that experience doing Momentum? What was that like? Yeah, I was, um, so in my professional life, I, I have to kind of expand my knowledge and, and we're engaging heavily in entrepreneurship and helping um, others in the region create their own startups. And I wanted to gather more knowledge. And about a, uh, several years ago, I actually reached out to Lou and we did a class project um, where my students doing um interface design. We actually got them to evaluate his website at the time and provide him some feedback. I think it was a value to him and we talked, but we had actually, the students all did a live critique. So I got to know Lou that way and I got to learn more that he's more than just a podcast. He's more than just a, the Disney expert. He's he's just somebody who's very passionate, um, very positive. You can't find a more positive fellow, I don't think. Um, <laughs> and, 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 he's, and he's taken that leap of faith that I spoke about before. So he knows a lot, um, and, and he's just a really fun guy to work with. So all of a sudden, as I was trying to formulate, you know, my strategy for work, how I was going to expand my knowledge on entrepreneurship and, and what conferences to go to and this and that, I saw the workshop pop up. The workshop pop up called Momentum. So I looked at it and I I, I decided, you know what, this is great because. The selling point that he had, and I shouldn't say it's a selling point, but the main point of this particular event is the fact that when you go there, just like, well, first of all, when you go to any conference, you get excited, you get knowledge, and then you're like, I'm going to go and do this, and everyone's running out high-fiving, you know, <laughs> and then you get back to work, and you're like, well, what was that about again? What, what, what do I do next, you know? And that happened a lot to me in a lot of conferences over the years, and all of a sudden, he said, no, I'm going to give you something tangible and something to work with, and I'm thinking, great, I could take this, and I'm going to take it back to the, uh, the entrepreneur stuff that we're building, and we're, I'm going to pass this along in some way, shape, or form to the people we're going to work with. Well, when I got there, um, I had already been doing consulting work on the side, and I, I take the consulting that I do on the side, and I weave that into my classes. That's how I stay sharp, because you, I'm, I'm sure you understand technology changes. So, yeah. and, I, and I don't do it, and I, I don't make a ton of money doing it, and I just do it on the side, and it so it doesn't impact my teaching, it doesn't impact my students, but they benefit from it. This was the same thing. When I got into this meeting, and I, especially in the mastermind group, well, first of all, the first day that I got there, I, I finally got a chance to meet Lou face to face because we were all virtual until then. <laughs> Shook his hand and I just said, thank you. You know, it's been great to, to work with him. And I sure he, he hears that a lot. But we sat down and I sat down at a table who I, I, I don't realize who I sat down with until I left. I was at the table sitting there with Lauren Gagioli and Jennifer Hoffman. Um, Michelle Bordeaux was there. Uh, I mean, these are people, I think I sat at the wrong table. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, because uh, I came in late, um, I was I was so nervous, actually, that morning to go down. It was a small workshop group, and I really didn't know what to expect. Well, anyway, great talking, great great delivery of, of content and so on. And then we went into the mastermind group and then that's where I really saw how a mastermind can, a mastermind group can operate and we go around the horn and we're talking about it. And, and I had this idea about getmecoding.com, but I was so broad and all over the place and trying to be everything to everybody. And then they, they reined me in and, and that was the result of that process. Um, so there was getmecoding.com you see today, which is by far not a polished result. It, it needs some work and I'm going to continue to refine it. But it, it allowed me to hear feedback from people who the room was filled with people who were already, in, in my opinion, I'm sure that they would disagree, but they've arrived. They've, they've done it. And now they're looking back at us. And there were people in the room who were just throwing ideas at the wall. And we went all around the horn. And I was, and I, was I think for me personally, at least I like to think I was in the middle of that pack. Mm -hmm. I, I had been doing consulting. I, I know what it's like to run my own consulting business, you know, even just with me and maybe one subcontractor. So I, I got the feel. I know what it's like to go through the, the, the administration side of a, of a business. Um, and then I, I know what it's like to get the work done, work with customers. And then I thought, well, hey, I, you know, I got this going. But then all of a sudden I'm realizing there's a whole other area that I have no knowledge of. And, 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 and then you, you know, and this is what you talk about a lot is like uh, being an entrepreneur and, and if you want to call it the spiritual side or the psychological side or whatever, it's an incredible journey, isn't it? I mean, it's like you learn a lot about yourself yeah. and, and that's, and that's what it was. So hearing Lou talk and getting us together in that room, uh, I, I, I like to say I, I owe him a lot for getting me to take that, that first step, um, in a very definitive direction. And that's, now you're then we're having, and actually, and that's how we're having this conversation, I guess, exactly. you know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's where we are. 
Yeah, that that's awesome, and that's that's what excited me about that um, momentum when when he first announced it because I was like, first off, you're you're in Florida, and uh, of course you gotta visit Disney. You're there already, but mm-hmm. I mean, you may not, but because it is it's a three day event usually. But um, I was excited because it was it was something that was new in the sense that uh, you had somebody who was you know he keeps it small so he can focus on what you're doing. A lot of yes. these, you know, kind of things, uh, these events, when they have something like this, they have like, you know, 19 speakers in a day and, you know, they're all speaking yeah. at different times. You got to pick which one you want. And, and it's three days and even more rare, do you get to actually go up and ask them and talk to them for, you know, 20 minutes because they're doing something else. So they got to go make their own contacts and stuff. So when he, when he announces, I was like, this is, this is genius. This is perfect because there's so many people I know who would love to do you know, to have that kind of hands-on experience. And, and that's what made me sign up with the Hub. And that's what, you know, I, I was excited when he announced, you know, Momentum. And I'm sure, I'm sure Magic Cheers, first off, let me just say, it's not like we get paid by Lou or nothing. It's just he's that uh, much of a presence uh, to affect the lives that he's that he's been around. So that's why we get excited to talk about him because he's truly somebody who th- you are able to look up to as far as this is what I want to do business-wise, you know, be successful as he is. And then also, he's just an all-around guy who very rarely do you run into people like this who truly care about your well-being. And and and, and I don't mean that in the sense of like just to care. I mean like he literally would probably give you the shirt off his back if he knew it was going to help in some way. So um, that's why we we go on and on about Lou. But you know what, Lou's not here. So let's stop talking about him. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it is time now, uh, Fred, to get into our Disney Power Round. And now it's time for the Disney Power Round, where we talk favorite parks, tips, and tricks for your magical Disney trip. Let's bibbity bobbity do this. All right. All right. So, what is your favorite Disney park and one thing that you love about it? Epcot. Oh, quick. <laughs> so, I like it. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is a great, this is a question that goes around my household a lot. We, you know, I've been going to Disney forever and not forever. Um, I think the first time I visited Disney was 1982 and it was, um, then followed up two years later to a visit to Disneyland. And, and I didn't realize what I was starting. I was starting a fanatical obsession with, um, <laughs> this place that just gives people so much joy when Epcot, when I visited Epcot, um, so I returned to Disney world. Uh, I think I owe my father-in-law a lot. Um, he invited me when I was dating his daughter at the time. He said, Fred, why don't you come along with us to our, our Walt Disney World vacation? So I went along, and when I returned to Epcot, I returned to a place that I'd never been to before, and I was I was just blown away. It was just that place that was like, wow, this is incredible. Um, and, and, and granted, being a little bit older, I was in my 20s at that time, I, I appreciated things a little bit differently. But Epcot is my, my park of choice. Awesome. Yeah, no, Epcot is is one I think a lot of us – uh, we don't think about as being a park, a destination to go, but I love it. I love it because I know they're going to do so many changes to it. I know eventually, like, you know, this is something I, I say a lot, which is it's it's going to be a two, they're making every park a two-day visit. That's their goal. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. but I love the fact that it's not that packed there. I love the fact that it's it's so peaceful. You walk around. You, another pla- In other words, there's places that you can go and not be swarmed. And, yes. and I and I really enjoy that about Epcot because you have the music playing, you get a nice drink, you get a nice little snack, you sit down, you watch the water, you watch the birds, and yeah, and, and then like the other half of me comes to me and yells at me and says, "You spend so much money here, you better get on a ride." And I'm like, "Okay, get on." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you you touched on exactly what what I love about it. If you were to come in my office or sit outside by you know by my my grill where I have a speaker out there, um, you'll hear the the park music playing, mm-hmm. and I love it. Um, the one station I listen to will at nine o'clock they start the Illuminations uh, oh, sequence, awesome. and, and yeah, and it, that music is just tied to so many great memories. My wife and I in Germany, my, my daughters and I, uh, exploring, uh, the food in Japan, my son and I kind of roaming around Mexico, trying on sombreros. Um, you know, it, there's just so many, we have so many memories tied to that. And, and I've, and you said it too, uh, really well, it's, it's the openness of it. Um, you, you really get immersed in it and, and what changes are coming, you know, Lou says it a lot, but I, I, I agree with it. It's like, I, I trust the Imagineers. Yeah. <laughs> there's something about, there's something about future world. That's just nostalgic. And it has that eighties feel to it, that yeah, something about it. Yeah. And I know whatever changes are going to come that it's not going to be stripped away to the point where we're not going to recognize it. 
Very I true. think it's going to be good. Yeah. yeah, very true. They they've not let me down yet, but uh, but yeah, that's that's definitely something I, I do enjoy about it. So, yes. what would then be your tip for that first time Disney goer? I, I, once again, I think you said it. You don't go there expecting to do it all. Uh, I think a lot. I, I yeah, I just I know families um, who who don't go to uh, Disney World, and they go down and they come back and they they they'll say they hated it because they did. They got overwhelmed and they went at the wrong time of the year. They didn't they didn't realize that it, it's a it's a it's an event you have to plan for. Like a lot of people expect vacations that yeah you just go boom that's it. Disney World's a little bit different. I don't say that in a bad way either. Um, and and. To another point, my my daughter's boyfriend and and his friend they went down there for a bachelor party. They flew all the way down from Pennsylvania to go to wow. a bachelor party. But there were people in their group that never went there before. They left on a Saturday morning, but they flew out on a Monday. So their experience of Disney World is a two day whirlwind, and they didn't even spend the full days in the park. Wow. They went out to uh, Universal the one day, and some of them came back with an off taste in their mouth. They thought it was going to be like that kind of park where you can go to and run on, run from each roller coaster to each <laughs> roller coaster. Um, and, and, but, but yeah, I think for the first time Disney goer, you have to go down there with the expectation or the understanding. You're not going to be able to see everything. So make that one park awesome. For sure. Yeah. Definitely plan that. Cause yeah, you, you will have a bad experience yes. and, and it's, it's definitely not fun and very confusing when you have a worse experience at supposedly the most best place in the world. So it yes. definitely will mess with your brain. So Yes, it does. <laughs> mm-hmm. So what would then be your tip for somebody who goes multiple times to Disney? Yeah, that... So my 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 kids uh, <laughs> my my running joke is, oh dad, what's your favorite ride? My, and my response has always been the bench. <laughs> and um, I, I'm like, I, I do love rides. Don't get me wrong. I'm a mission space guy. I, I'm test track. I, I'm uh, Expedition Everest. I'm Pirates of the Caribbean. I love all of them, all of them. And Ooh. but I, I think for someone that goes there multiple times or 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 is a season one, I think our challenge, we know what we like. We know we want to get there. Um, I think a challenge is to reverse it or undo it. You know, like um, our our ongoing thing is we hit Magic Kingdom first. And I think now with Pandora opening and, and the expansion of the Animal Kingdom, I think we might have to be rethinking. We might want to go there first uh, and, and do that. But I think if you can force yourself to do something, I think you might surprise yourself and find something you might like. Um, and I only could say that because I did a solo trip once. I was in and out of the park real quick. And I did some things that I didn't normally do. I'm like, wow, I did not expect that to be like that. Because, you know, when you're with the group of 15 or 16, sometimes you don't get to see and do what you want to do. Yeah. And um, we we kind of always avoided the one thing. And all of a sudden, I, I went back. I had the opportunity to see it on my own. And I was blown away by it. I'm like, this was fantastic. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I love that, though. The bench. Uh, yes. <laughs> I have about... I don't know. I'm up to 35 or 42 <laughs> pictures of benches, and there's nobody on them, which is the key part. Um, no. <laughs> it's my it's my my bench album. Yeah, that's awesome. That'll be another website one day. Oh, for sure. Like, no, that's a great idea. Benches of Disney. <laughs> uh, so, Fred, I do want to thank you for coming on and sharing your story with us, and and I know inspiring the listeners here. But before we do sign off, I'd love for you to share, you know, all your social contacts. Let everybody know where they can find more about you. Uh, where do you want them to to go? Um, especially, of course, the website, and uh, go ahead and, and let them know that now. Sure, thank you. So you can come out to www.getmecoding.com. That's getmecoding.com, and you could sign up or just visit the site. If you sign up, you get updates, of course, and we'll be in touch with you, and we'll be uh, sending you other information. You could follow me on the Twitter at getmecoding.com, or excuse me, at getmecoding. Um, and also on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash get me coding. Those are the best place. We're also out there on Pinterest. Um, you could find me as Fred Abley and that's a E B as in boy L I, and that you can forward slash, or you can go out to the, the board for get me coding where I post some things out there. And I'm also on Instagram as Fred Abley, not as get me coding, but I'm trying to be, um, available to people and where they are. And uh, I'd love for people just to let me know what they think of the site. And by all means, if you have a question or you're curious, or even if you have a question about higher education and, and the degrees that are out there, I, I can help with some advice along those lines. But definitely, if you want to learn how to code, you want to get exposed to some technology, or even see something on the site you'd like to see added, yeah, let me know. 
Awesome. And guys, of course, all of that's going to be in the show notes, so you guys can definitely check it out there as well. But uh, please be sure to go check out all this, all of this good stuff that, that Fred has. Um, definitely exciting. And, you know, again, what I love about having guests on the show is because you can you can go there, you can see what they're doing, and you can kind of pace yourself with them in a way that's saying, okay, this is where they started. This is where they are now. If I get started, maybe I can be, you know, in a different position a couple months later as well. And and I and that's why I love having you guys on to share your stories, to let people know you didn't start out, you know, knowing everything. You didn't start out being successful at anything. You didn't start everything took work, everything took time, but it was about starting. Because without that, you you know, you never get anywhere. So you know what I, if if I could say one thing to that, Joe, mm-hmm. um, real quick. Somebody shared this bit of advice and I shared it with our group. Um, never compare your beginning to somebody's else somebody else's middle. Oh. And I, I think sometimes when we're all starting off, we all want to be there. We all want to be successful. And, and we have to remember that we, we all have to step out with what you just said, that first step. Definitely. That's, that's, I like that saying. Uh, so, guys, be sure to check that out. And, you know, Fred, before we do go, I do leave, you know, some time for a guest to just give some advice, some inspiration. Uh, you know, this podcast comes out on Sunday. And, and if they're listening on Sunday, let's give them some encouragement for that Monday or whatever Monday it is. Uh, their Monday is, I should say, uh, when they're listening to this. So if you could just give, you know, real quick, just some advice, some inspiration uh, for the listeners listening. Sure. I think first off, take that first step. It, it all starts with a st- you, you, the longest journey starts with a first step. And if you do that a little bit at a time, you're going to see great things happen. Also, remember, you're working on making a better version of yourself, ultimately. And if you're true to that idea, great things are going to come, whether it's taking care of your family, a business, or whatever. I think just keep on producing or making a way to make yourself better. And and ultimately, sometimes being a better version of ourself means it comes through helping others. And that might be in educating them on a topic, um, getting them to think differently about a topic or whatever it may be. But if you if you follow that, I don't want to call it a mantra, but if you follow that, I think it ultimately spirals up and and great things come from it. And uh, the sky is the limit. And, and the last thing, um, you know, I shared this the other day. I think a lot of us that get pulled into these entrepreneurial things or just like to be busy, don't forget to recharge, you know, reload and ultimately relax. And, and I think I, I know I just, I shared that with somebody the other day and we, we, we tend to be our, our, our worst critics or our hardest judges. And I think if we can ultimately relax a little bit, that's when the great ideas happen. Um, and it happens in the shower. It happens when you're, when you're doing absolutely nothing, that's when your greatness starts to peak through. But it's when you have all that noise around you, um, you, you, you miss it. So true. Yeah. I, yesterday I actually, I tweeted, um, that I didn't like not having anything to do. Like I felt like I wasn't being productive, <laughs> but you're so right because honestly I was burning myself out because I just kept thinking, 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 trying of different ideas. And sure enough, by just simply, you know, stopping, taking some time out, relaxing, um, I started getting the ideas again. And so uh, now I'm, of course, working on them. So definitely agree with that. I mean, uh, that's some great advice there. It's, it's hard to turn the brain off because sometimes you have to do it just for the good of your brain. <laughs> yes. So, so that's yes. very true. Uh, but Fred, I do want to thank you for coming on. I'm really, really excited that, you know, it's funny, we've never met. And yet I've met you through a mutual friend and uh, I think that's what I love about, of course, the hub and everything like that. And the show, because I'm able to meet so many amazing people. And I look forward to one day being able to actually shake your hand uh, and saying hello. So um, thank you for coming on. Thank you for spending your time with the Magic Cheers. And before we do go, I do like to have the guests now say the sign off with me. So I'm going to say what I say. And all I need you to say after is just stay magical. All right. You got it. Here we go. Thank you guys for listening. Have a great night, day, weekend, whenever you're listening to this. And as always, stay magical. Awesome. Thank you, Fred. No, thank you, Joe. This has been a pleasure. And I, and I, and I will look forward to that handshake. And as Lou would say, a hug. So There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was the Talk About the Magic podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to rate, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks for listening. And as always, stay magical.